My name is Bart Coppens and I'm going into therapy because I have a problem. I have a crippling addiction to moths. I haven't seen any moths for days which my therapist recommended to me and I'm starting to have withdrawal symptoms. Everything looks like a moth right now. Oh god. Is that a moth? Is that a moth? That looks like a moth, right? Oh, it's just a leaf. Damn it. I'm starting to lose it. I see moths everywhere. Oh god, what's that? Wait a second. That actually looks like a moth. Huh? Wow, can you believe it? This actually is a species of moth. Wow! Uh-oh. My therapist is going to be so angry. Ladies and gentlemen, this beautiful greenish yellow fluffy thing I just found is actually a moth. I'm not kidding you. If you don't believe me, let me turn this around and you can see its beautiful and cute little eyes and face. Wow! Isn't that really cool? Now this incredible insect is a species of leopard moth. Its common name is the Rose Myrtle Leopard Moth. Its scientific name is Trabala Vishnu. Even though my therapist said no more moths for you Bart Coppens, your addiction is ruining your life. The life cycle of one species cannot hurt, right? Wait, let me ask my therapist. Is it okay if I show my fans one more life cycle? Then I'll quit forever, I promise. Okay, one more life cycle, okay. but then you'll be forced to go into therapy. Okay, that's a deal. I'll do extra therapy sessions and I will, for the last time, I promise, do one more moth pieces, okay, and then I'll, then I'll quit forever. I will show you the life cycle of this insect today on my channel. Let's get started. And let's go back in time where the life cycle of this insect started, in the egg stage. Let's start the intro. This episode starts the same way that all my Moth Cycles episodes do, with little baby caterpillars. These babies are just one day old and they were just born. Isn't that amazingly cute? I hatched their little eggs in a petri dish. They are the babies of the Rose Myrtle Leopard Moth, Trabala Vishnu. Time to give them food. Now breeding this species, in my opinion, is easy. But getting them to eat can be the most difficult part. Generally they love eucalyptus, sweet gum, rose myrtle, rose, oak tree, guava, eugenia, birch, willow cherry and many more plants. But the problem is that sometimes they refuse to eat plants they should be able to eat according to the scientific literature. And I'm not sure why. Could it be that different populations from different countries or locations prefer to eat different plants in the wild and have different tastes? 
I have this, raised this species many times before on plants like eucalyptus and oak tree. Despite that, sometimes I will receive eggs that reject oak or eucalyptus, while in other instances they will eat it. Hmm, mysterious. Turns out, my caterpillars immediately prefer to eat sweet gum. Ah, good old sweet gum. I would be helpless without you. Such a versatile plant that many species will eat. Baby caterpillars have stripes and amazingly feed in large groups. They remind me of a herd of zebras. Then let's leave them alone for now. I checked back a few days later and guess what? Some of them were already shedding their skins to insta number two. Now that was fast if you ask me. Let me show you inside of their plastic box. Wow, so beautiful. This is a species I recommend to every breeder. They are a beginner and friendly uh, and beautiful species. Before you get any ideas, please do keep in mind that they are classified as a tropical pest species. If you live in a subtropical or a tropical climate, it's a bad idea to import these animals to your country since they could be invasive. But in temperate climates such as mine, there is no risk, thankfully. Sometimes legal offspring is available in the hobby. But to be honest, if you live in a tropical country, keeping exotic insects from other countries is a stupid idea in general. Anyway, the larvae are developing beautifully and are surprisingly colorful. Hope you enjoyed the show. I worked hard on this video. Let's leave them alone for now and check back on them about a week later. I left them alone for about a week at this point and even decided to upgrade them from a plastic box to a large pop-up cage for insects. Let me show you. Ladies and gentlemen, our Trabala Vishnu, what a name, Trabala Vishnu, are growing beautifully, so beautifully that I was forced to upgrade their enclosure into a cage. That's right. So let's open the cage and see how they are doing. If you've watched other videos of mine, especially Moth Cycles episodes, you probably already know the drill in the way I'm keeping them. Of course, as always, I have host plant here in a, in a small bottle of water, which keeps the plant fresh, almost like flowers in a vase. And if we take carefully take it out, we can take a look at the larva. Oh wow, ladies and gentlemen. One of the things about this species is that their larvae are utterly beautiful. Wow. This is instar number four. We also have some instar number threes left, which I will show you in a short moment's notice. But first, let's appreciate their growth. Wow. Look at their tufts of hair. Their yellow and bright blue. Can you see that? That is so beautiful and so colorful. Now if we zoom out a little, we'll notice that we have many larvae. More are on the underside of the leaf. But the whole plant is covered by larvae too. So if you turn the plant around, you'll see that there's more, as you can see. Some of them feeding in groups. Wow. So here we can also see some instant number threes and fours. If you have basic experience with the leopard moths, the last year company family, Trabala Vishnu will not be a big challenge for you. It's a really recommended species that can eat many types of plants. They're utterly magnificent and beautiful. Look at that. Unfortunately, there is one downside to raising this species, and that is especially in the later instars. The hairs of this species can be noxious. Now don't worry, they're not like extremely dangerous or anything, but they will give you mild itching. Yes, that's right, mild itching. So it's not like it's some super deadly caterpillar from a rainforest that can kill you. But if you are prone to allergies and stuff, that's good to know. In fact, if you have allergies, Maybe I don't recommend breeding them. Otherwise, 
give it a try. They are absolutely wonderful. I personally really like the look of these caterpillars. To me, they are one of the most beautiful. It's funny how they also have some tufts of silver hair. See, some of the patches of hair on their body are thick and white, while the rest of their bristles are more like thin and black. Wow. What a great species. And there's so many of them here also on the underside of the leaf. Can you see it, guys? So we have dozens of them at the moment, growing really well. So what's cool is they tolerate moderate temperatures because in the wild sometimes they are also found in more mountainous places where it can be cold at night. So back when I was studying moths in Asia, I've actually found these in the wild in multiple occasions too in Cambodia and Laos. It's uh, really quite somewhat of a common species of leopard moths in, uh, in Asia. You can see them everywhere. Wow, instar number three and four already. I'm happy that they are growing. I realize that this is the first episode in my web series Moth Cycles that shows the life cycle of a leopard moth, by the way. Wow, I can't believe it took me that many years to make one. The problem is that Moth Cycles takes a lot of time to produce. I can only make a few episodes per year. In fact, it took me one and a half year to, to produce the last 10 episodes. Filming the life history of insects is very time consuming and labor intensive work since they develop fast and you need to document the progress every few days. But at the same time, life cycles can also take months or even over a year. And I get a lot of requests for species in this web series, but it's probably going to take me years to do all the popular species for you. It helps if my fans support me though. Anyway, let's leave these caterpillars low now and check back on them later. Two weeks later, I was about to show you the progress of my caterpillars. And I'm going to be honest, two weeks is actually a large time skip. I realize I may have forgotten to film them every week like I usually do. So here's a gap of 14 days progress. Alright people, so my Trabala Vishnu have grown bigger and therefore I have upgraded their enclosure even more. They seem to be thriving. One thing I would like to do is as usual take a closer look at these amazing insects. I think that's the least we can do. Have to be careful. Ooh. Be careful also because the hairs of this species can be itchy. But uh, let's let's have a look. Oh wow, they have become really colorful and fuzzy. Just look at that. That is really great to see. And if we bend the camera down, you can see several of them sitting on one leaf. Beautiful hairy tufts in plain sight. Wow. Now on my channel, leopard moths, the last few Campidae family, usually don't get much attention. But I plan to change this in the future and I will make more leopard moth life cycles. And this is the actually the first of them in moth cycles, I guess. Starting with one of my favorites, because this species is gorgeous. Just look at the crazy caterpillars. Surely you guys must agree these caterpillars are really charismatic. And what's cool they have blue markings. Not just blue, but also yellow. And red. It really is an incredible species. Now they do seem to be somewhat social as you can see they hang out in groups. 
seem to enjoy each other's presence somewhat. Wow, really cool. So how many caterpillars do we have? This question is difficult to answer because I'm too lazy to count. But if we have here a quick look in the vegetation, you will see that yes indeed, there are many of them in all directions. Like here is even more. Let me put the light ring. Whoa, whoa, almost fell down. Yeah, this is my light ring. I use it for better lighting. Sorry, it's in the middle of winter. It makes filming tricky. But as you can see, the whole plant here is just full of caterpillars. All the leaves. So, we have plenty of caterpillars to go around. Trabala Vishnu, the rose myrtle leopard moth, is a moth of the family Lasiocampidae. It is found in Southeast Asia, including but not limited to Pakistan, India, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Java, China, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam and Indonesia. Four subspecies are recognized. They are mainly found in tropical to subtropical conditions. They tolerate moderate temperatures as well. For the species is often found in mountains and highlands, where temperatures are lower at night due to altitude. However, they are also quite frequently found in lowlands, but also in places with warm summers yet cold winters, such as Taiwan or parts of Japan and China. Therefore, the species is able to hibernate, which they do in the egg stage. Yes, if kept cold, the eggs of this species can hibernate. Unfortunately, the caterpillars of this species can have a taste for many economically important food crops for humans, which often classifies them as a pest. For example, Camellia sinensis or tea plant is something they are fond of, but also pomegranate, guava, coffee and other plants that are economically important are plants the caterpillars love to snack on. Of course, tea farmers, guava, pomegranate and coffee farmers are not too happy with this fact. In reality, this species is quite polyphagous on a large number of tropical plants. However, it is more of a generalist than a specialist. Also important to know is that the caterpillars can cause rashes for some people. They are not dangerous or super venomous and it's mostly just harmless itching. But still, that means this species is not family friendly, especially for people with allergies, immune deficiencies or asthma that may be extra sensitive to the irritating hairs of these caterpillars. The good news is that they are growing slowly but steadily, yay! That means that at least someone in this house is growing and making progress. <sighs> Wait Bart, what does this comment mean? In the beginning of this video, you promised to do therapy, and I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Please elaborate. Oh, so you really want me to go into therapy, huh? Well, when I say that I'm not making any progress, I was just being a little bit self-deprecating, you know? It was humor, I was making fun of myself. It's not true that I'm not making any progress in my life. I guess that those giant of jokes just come from a place of insecurity, you know? You know what it is? The thing is that my whole life I've been chasing a dream and that dream involves, I suppose it involves this YouTube channel as well, you know? Like, I spent years and years making YouTube videos trying to build a successful channel in that time, I probably could have had a, could have gotten a degree. I could have gotten a career instead, or a normal job, but I didn't. I didn't because I believe in this channel, you know. But I also realized there's a lot of stuff, a lot of opportunities that I've thrown away, and I realized that I don't have a plan B, and that gives me existential dread because, like, what if this channel doesn't work out, you know? What if in 5 or 10 years the channel is not going to be as successful as I'd hoped? And I invested everything in it. What am I going to do then? 
And that, my friends, is what gives me anxiety. And that's what makes me think sometimes I'm not making progress because, well, I invested everything that I have in one single thing, you know? It's like I, I gambled all my money on one horse. And what if the horse doesn't win the race, you know? Being a YouTuber, it is hard. It's a very competitive job. YouTube is a very competitive environment. And everything about it, the way that we thrive of attention, have to compete with other YouTubers, it's difficult. And if you invest everything that you have into something that's so transient, so fleeting as a YouTube channel, it's normal to have doubts. But then again, I really believe in this channel. I really believe in what I can do. And in some weird way, call it maybe blind faith, I'm still convinced that it is going to be successful someday. I think. I hope. That's why I keep trying, you know. I know it has potential, at least. But at the same time, there's times that I have doubts. If this channel doesn't work out, you know, what am I going to do? I invested too much into growing it. And from time to time it's working. From time to time it's going where I want to. But there's also sometimes months of stagnation. Some videos are successful, some videos are a massive flop. And sometimes I don't even know what will flop and what will get views. It's still a mystery to me after doing YouTube for so long. But wait, Bart, you you're know? amazing at giving advice to other people who have mental or existential problems. Maybe you should extend yourself the same courtesy. Are you telling what me? What advice would you give yourself what, what, in your what, own what position? What I would do if somebody came to me with the same problem? If somebody is really believes in a, a certain idea or a dream that they have? that they want to pursue in life, but they're afraid it doesn't work out? Well, I would probably tell them, uh, if somebody came to me with a dream that they have, or an ambition, I would certainly never tell them to give up, you know? Some of the most um, successful people who've made the biggest impact on our culture or society as a whole, are the people who started with a good idea, uh, a dream and never gave up and eventually made it. I also think it's very important in life to chase your dreams, to do what you love. But then again, I would say you have to do it in a way that is healthy, you know. Don't sacrifice friendships, don't sacrifice your career, don't sacrifice your education to chase a dream. And to be honest, if you have a dream that you want to achieve, you're more likely going to succeed if you have a stable life, if you have a job to support yourself, if you have friends to support you, if you have family, that's going to help you achieve your dream, maybe faster or not. But even if you don't succeed, it's going to make you want to pursue that dream in a more healthy way that doesn't burn you out, which is actually more likely to make you successful. Huh, maybe that's the advice I should be giving myself, too. Wow, is this what therapy feels like? Thank you, that makes sense. Wow, let's, let's continue the show, though. Let's go back to the caterpillars. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. However, let's go back to the caterpillars soon. It's time to check back on our babies one week later and see how much they can grow in one week. Hello everybody and welcome back. It has been a while since we checked up on our children. Let's see how they are doing. Wow. Okay, people. I do not yet see any signs of cocoon spinning, not even remotely. Despite that, I am in awe by the beauty of these caterpillars. Just look at that, the blue spots. 
That's just absolutely mesmerizing, absolutely beautiful. These are the treasures of nature. Just look at it. I want to touch it. Yes, you are beautiful. You are precious and you are valued. Beautiful caterpillar of mine. You guys make me so happy. You have no idea. Breeding moths, it is like my sunlight, you know? Makes my shitty life a positive one. So beautiful. This isn't even all of them. This is like half of them. Just wanted to put a few of them on my hand just for fun. Wow. I think that in a few weeks, maybe two weeks, we will see the first cocoon, maybe less. I love this species, it's a super species. So cool. Alright people, so they are definitely doing well, good progress, very little losses, but we still need some patience because they are definitely not fully grown. Not that much progress I guess. So let's check back again, once again, one week later. Hello. This is the leader of the Democratic Republic of Barcopensia speaking. No, but really, that was cringe. I am here to show you something else. And that's this weird, hairy little thing in my hand. Can you see the hairy thing I'm holding right now? No, I mean, I mean my right hand, this one, not the other one. So, um, if we zoom in. Ta -da 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 -da. We see this really um, inconspicuous little thing. It's a bit hairy. Turns out that this is the cocoon of Trabala Vishnu. So this is what I want to show you. It means that at least one caterpillar here has formed a cocoon. Cocoons have an interesting shape and are lined with defensive hairs. These hairs, if you touch them, they can give you itches rashes so be careful with touching the cocoons they can be noxious anyway we're just going to take the cocoon and keep it here for a while other caterpillars don't seem to have cocooned yet but they will follow suit as we can see the other caterpillars are doing just fine so this is about their maximum size, it's not super big, but the species by itself is not very big either. So this is about the biggest that you can expect from Trabala Vishnu. I think this will also soon make um, 
cocoons. Can you see the color change? This caterpillar is more like pink to brown, instead of its usual color. Before the caterpillars spin cocoons, they often turn pink. That's how you can recognize their development um, is near finished. We already found the first cocoon, so let's leave them alone and check back later to grab some more cocoons. Now it's time to take it slow. The caterpillars are forming cocoons at this point. I collected the cocoons every day and I decided to check back on them three weeks later. But I had a problem. I planned a trip soon to London and it can interfere with my breeding plan. I'm going to the United Kingdom for a week to visit some friends. But I'm probably going to have to miss a few days of progress because of that. It is that time of the week again to check how my beautiful children are doing. Ooh, let's take a look. First things first, some caterpillars have grown very, very big, actually bigger than I expected. Can you see that? So, whoops, sorry. That's the artificial light I use for filming because indoors it's dark in winter. So I amplify the light and it just fell. Anyway, as we can see, some of the trabala are actually reaching a decent size here compared to my finger. Some of them are bigger than I expected to, uh, them to be. I suppose it's the female caterpillars who grow bigger and older. Simply, well, because the females in this species are like twice as big as the males, so it makes total sense. But we also find a lot of cocoons in the vegetation. Mainly I'm going to be just using scissors to collect some of the cocoons that I see here in the back. Have to be careful. The cocoons are pretty noxious. And this case is about to collapse, so we have to be careful. There's just too much stuff in here, I have to remove some. But as you can see, here's two new cocoons. They are sitting here on twigs, we'll film them later. Just using some scissors to collect. The cocoons here in the back. Oof, I just touched one and it hurts. Oh, I hate the splinter like appendages that they have. It's horrible. Right, 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 right. So, this big pile of trash that we are looking at here is actually the leaves we used to raise the larva, some of the old twigs. And as we can see, there's many cocoons in it. So, I will just get to the point and Remove as much of them as I can. Oh my! Quite a lot of cocoons, I see. There you go. Maybe this is a bit of a boring part, but at least I am showing you how to properly harvest cocoons. Use scissors, cut them off the branch. Of course, don't rip the cocoons apart, they must be intact for the safety of the insect. There is no better place for an insect to pupate than in their natural cocoon. So there you go. More. Wow, that's a lot. So let's skip this. You guys probably get the point by now. Or not. This is what we have left, people. Surprisingly, after making so many cocoons, you would expect that we don't have many caterpillars left, but we do! Um, why? I think we just had a really good result. We seem to have a high number of individuals this time, high survival rate, basically everything a successful breeding needs. Let me zoom in here a little bit. And we can see that the larvae are just all crawling over this plant. I don't know how many there are left, but I'm making the estimation that... Hmm... There's definitely like... Well, it's over 10 of them. I think it's like 15, maybe even 20. 20 larvae that did not make cocoons yet. Here's 
one of them. Close-ups. Really a wonderful species, to be honest. Really wonderful. Vibrant. Beautiful. Fascinating. Is it not? Really great. The Rose Myrtle Lapid Moth. Remember the name if you enjoy this episode. One tip is don't import this species to tropical countries. All right, it's a pest. It's a tropical pest. But I live in a temperate country. There's no chance that the insect will survive here. They're in quarantine, they're in captivity, but in the wild they wouldn't be able to survive either. Yet if you play, live in a place like Florida, I don't know, be careful with importing stuff like this. Nonetheless, you can see them on my channel so you're not missing out. There's no need to breed them in real life if you can just view them on my channel. Eh? Beautiful. Alright folks, the babies are back in their cage. That is right, so let us check back later and see how these progress. How many cocoons are there so far? And I'm saying so far because, because not all of them have made cocoons yet. One, two, three, four. Well, actually it makes no sense to count them because not all of them have made cocoons yet. So I stop counting actually. You can count if you like, but I will recount them when all the caterpillars are finished. Otherwise I'm it's not even accurate. It's not even the final number. There you go. Now as you can see there is really a nice amount of cocoons at least. Oh do I have all of them in the picture? Let me zoom out. Actually maybe I didn't even capture all of them. Now I do. Look at that. That's a really decent amount of cocoons here. There's even two cocoons on this stick. Oh wow. Looks like we are going to have a good amount of insects. They did really well. I'm happy with that. It's always satisfying when you have a good result. Low mortality. That's how it's supposed to be. But that's not always how it goes. Because breeding moss is a more difficult hobby than people like to admit. And failure is something we all have to deal with. But this time, this time there is no failure. Now, one thing that we see is the cocoons are very hairy. And they have these typical two humps, as you can see. All of the cocoons, no matter which one, have this shape. And uh, we let's be careful, these cocoons are a little bit toxic. The hairs on the, that they use in the cocoons are their body hairs, the stingy, rashy hairs that can give you skin irritations. Starting to get annoyed because my camera refuses to focus on the subject here. Ah, there you go. So you can see typically all the cocoons have these two humps, same shape. And the stick that they're sitting on is also covered with hairs. They don't just spin their cocoons with hairs, but they cover the whole stick where they pupate with hair. It's because the hairs are protective. Probably keeps stuff like ants away from their cocoons. There you go. See that? These hairs. Uh, now the, the pupil stage of Trabala Vishnu. I think it lasts about, uh, what is it, five weeks? As you can see, I'm actually starting to get some skin rashes from touching the cocoons. It's really itchy. This is interesting because the caterpillars to me are not irritating at all. Caterpillars are almost harmless, but when they make the cocoons, the cocoons are irritating. But that's part of the job if you deal with moths. Some of them have toxins and chemicals, you know how it goes. Right, so to make these uh, moths emerge, just going to prepare here a special container for them. Very important for emerging moths is that they have something to climb up to. Uh, let me rearrange this a little bit more convenient. 
why climb up? That's because moths generally need to hang upside. Well, they don't have to hang upside down. A vertical surface is often enough. Uh, sorry, a horizontal surface. No, vertical. Damn, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm having Alzheimer's, I swear. They can uh, inflate their wings against like a wall or a tree trunk. They don't always have to hang literally upside down, but they need to, to climb because they cannot do it on the floor. That's the most important thing. So an improvised container like this, uh, it will work, I guarantee. It will work. It's a good, small, controlled environment here. So, there you go. We're just going to leave them in here, check back every few weeks. See if any of them have popped out, essentially. That way I also don't have to touch the toxic cocoons again all the time. Because that, it gets old really fast. To have skin rashes all over your hands, it's not that pleasant. I don't enjoy it. It's the worst part of my hobby. So I'll, I'll add some sticks too later so they have grip. But this is the basics and it works. It just works. Hello everyone, I have good news. Uh, I was checking my cocoons today, sorry I have the hiccups. I was checking my cocoons today and I found the first Trabala Vishnu sitting there. Now I'm a little bit anxious because I booked a trip to London, a vacation to London for one week. And in 10 days I'm leaving to London. But that could mean that while I'm traveling, a lot of the moths could be hatching, which means I'm going to miss their emergence. So if there is an awkward time skip in this video and I go to London and all my moths hatch while I'm not there, yeah, that would be annoying. Anyway, here it is. The mail. At least we can film this one right before I go travel. This was the first one to come out. And this is the mail of the rose myrtle lapid moth. Wow, let's have a closer look. Now this piece is truly is an incredible one. Because as you can see, the mills are pretty uh, camouflaged as leaves and they are green in color. Now the color green here is interesting because you don't see that many big moth species that are green. There's a lot of small green moth species, like loopers, the geometrids. But when it comes to like really big moths like these, it's more rare. And I think that maybe that's because it's difficult to produce a lot, lot of green pigment in wing scales for a large insect, because you need a higher quantity of it. That's what I think, but I'm not sure really. I'm not entirely sure of the biochemistry behind it. All I know is that large moths like Saturnid and Lasiocampids, they more often tend to be brown or grey, but sometimes even yellow, but green on a large moth species you don't see it that often. It is really gorgeous, isn't it? As beautiful as they are, however, the males of this species are very short-lived. Usually live for less than one week, which is quite unfortunate. Despite that, it is worth to raise them in captivity, really, because they are actually quite beautiful. So what we have to do now is we have to wait for a female to come out if we can. That would be great. So that they can pair. Very beautiful, huh? Here's this, ladies and gentlemen. Trabala Vishnu. I think this is the first uh, life cycle of a leopard moth species, right? That we've done in moth cycles so far. Yeah, it must be. Hmm. That's pretty cool, too. There you go. Pretty, huh? Eh? 
Wow, awesome. Let's check back three days later. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. I hope you're having a good time and are enjoying it. I certainly enjoy filming it. Anyway, we are back indoors right now. That's because it's winter as we speak and that means that outdoors we have a very short amount of time in daylight. The sun goes down around, well, five o'clock in the evening already. On top of that, it's already dark and cold and a lot of days it's raining so I can't bring my camera outdoors to film the insects, so we do the indoor filming. Unfortunately, due to that, the lighting is very suboptimal. That's why I don't like breeding in winter, I'm along, among many other things. But I was just checking my Trabala box, and yesterday I showed you this beautiful green meal, but I noticed a few more have been hatching, so let's take a look, even with the bad lighting. First step is to open up our box and have a look inside and see what it is. Ah, oh wow, I can see several new males that have come out, including this one for example. And let's hope the camera is willing to participate. Wow, let's be real, that is absolutely gorgeous, that is really beautiful. Wow. What a nice species this is. Let me ask you guys a question. Do you think it's possible to fall in love with a species of insect? If not, I think I've fallen in love right now. Look at the beautiful green colors. They really are incredible, are they not? Wow. What is the status so far, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we have four moths. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here is the status so far. Four beautiful leafy green insects. This species is really cool because they look so much like dead leaves. And when you touch them, they even pretend to be dead, like the two ones here on top. Anyway, now you can see estimator wingspan, even though officially the scientific wingspan measurement should be done with a taxidermied specimen whose wings have been put in a spread position in a 45 degree angle from wingtip to wingtip measured on the four wings. Despite that, I think the wingspan board, even though not scientific, is a good way on YouTube to show to my viewers the size and scale of the insects that we breed on YouTube, just so that they can make an educated guess on their size. Of course, insects raised in captivity do not represent the size of wild animals, but this way we may get an idea. This species is really one of my favorites. They're really an enchanting little species. They're like fairies, can you see it? One thing that's unfortunate is that their green colors, the scales, they rub off very easy. Three of these mills are fresh, but just by handling them and putting them here on this board, we can already see that some of their scales like here and here have already been rubbed off a little bit. So 
the, whoop, one of them just flew and it seems that when this species flies they leave around a lot of their hairs and scales. So in a few days of time they are usually not that pretty anymore. I myself, however, do think that they are quite beautiful and charismatic and we've done a good job of breeding them so far. They're also very fuzzy, very hairy. A nice little species, huh? Wow. And there's probably many more coming soon from the cocoons. That's great. That is great. What a beautiful species, people. I think I'm going to put them in a cage now, a more appropriate enclosure for moths. They kind of remind me of salad leaves. Reminder to eat your vegetables, kids. Otherwise, you'll have to become a YouTuber and a terrible person like me. What do you mean, Bart? Do you want to elaborate on that? Reminder, you have therapy. Are you really forcing me to do this whole therapy thing? That's so lame. I'm just trying to breathe some moths here. <sighs> okay, listen, okay, when I when I call myself a terrible person or or failed because I'm a YouTuber, I'm just making fun of myself, right? Don't worry, like, um, I'm actually quite confident of a person in general, confident in my own abilities and confident what I do. It's strange being confident at the same time, but sometimes you struggle to feel good about yourself. How do you feel good about yourself? There's days that I'm really happy to be who I am. To be the guy on YouTube with all the moths, you know. But on other days there's just kind of this voice that, I don't know, makes me self-deprecate, makes me make fun of myself, I suppose. And I guess it all also ties into my ego, you know. You know, one of the bad things that I tend to do is sometimes I easily befriend people who are struggling in life, you know, people who, who struggle with issues. And then I give them advice. And that's how I bond with them. But the truth is, I think a part of me also befriends people who have a lot of problems. Because in some fucked up way, they make me feel good about myself, right? It's like seeing, oh, this person is worse off than me. And because that person makes me feel good about myself, I become close with them. But that's a toxic thing to do, actually. And even worse, sometimes when they think I'm their friend and they become successful, later in life and they don't have problems anymore that's why I cut them off because when they become more successful than me you know they don't make me feel good about myself anymore I guess it is just fragility of my ego maybe because maybe it's like sometimes I kind of feel like I use people to feed my ego I, because maybe I look down on them and their problems. I'm going That's to be honest kind of with bad. you, Bart. That is pretty fucked up. You know, I'm a therapist, but fuck it. You are actually a terrible person. Everybody watching this, unsubscribe from Bart's what channel kind of, right now. What kind of therapist are you? Dude, you're supposed to help me. Not criticize me. I'm opening up here, okay? Damn. Damn. Let's go back to the moths. One day later. What you're looking at right now is an enclosure for insects. Here I have a handful of uh, fake leaves. Leafy moths. And... I suppose. 
that we can open it carefully and then I will just place the moon moths inside here on the bottom of their cage and this is where they're going to be for now we have four males so we're going to wait for a female to arrive one thing that is problematic about this species is that the males can grow so much faster than the females because the males are smaller and finish their development faster. I still have some caterpillars. Take a look. So now as we can see some of the caterpillars have already turned into moths. But some of the slowest caterpillars are still eating. And that is really annoying when you breed this species. Because the slow caterpillars that turn into the moths the latest are often the females. That's because the females are twice as big as the males and they take twice as long to develop. So by the time that this caterpillar has turned into a moth, this male will be already dead. Oh, he just flew away. Males only live for like five days. And these caterpillars, who are the big ones who take longer, are more likely to be females. And that's why synchronizing them is actually quite difficult sometimes. You need a lot of luck to have a male and female out at the same time. I guess it's also a natural mechanism to prevent incest. Because if they're from the same brood, Males and females from the same brood will hardly encounter each other unless they are from different broods. For example, if the males from one brood close a little bit later and the females from another brood earlier, they can meet each other and pair. But not with their own siblings that have the same growth rate. Breeding this species is not difficult, not always, but the pairing is the hardest part because you need luck to have males and females at the same time. So it's a little bit stupid that I still have caterpillars to feed while some of them are already turning into moths. It's part of the game, I suppose. Let's cut some of the cocoons out. A lot more cocoons, I see. Dang. I haven't counted there yet, but this is a lot of cocoons. Now compare it with all the old cocoons that we still have. That's a lot of cocoons in total. Guys, I'm gonna be honest. This was actually a really successful rearing. Like really, really, really successful, successful. Because we produced a huge amount of cocoons. Now be careful, like I said, just like my WhatsApp chat and my Discord server, the cocoons are toxic. Lots of toxicity. I, I blame mental illness and loneliness. But that's okay. You know, our generation has its own issues. I think it has a tendency to make people histrionic and have attachment issues, emotional issues, etc. People want to be validated, people are lonely, they want a parasocial relationship with a YouTuber. But they all have different opinions on things and on what's funny and what's appropriate. And it cannot be aligned and that's how you create a mess. Anyway, enough about that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I have chat groups, I have a WhatsApp chat, a Discord server. You can join it, you can talk with other people there. It's great fun. Join it if you're curious. We even have voice chat nights in Discord. Once in a while. So yeah, let's add all the cocoons in here. I'm starting to feel like maybe this is too many cocoons in one container. I hope the moths will not have trouble e closing. Mm, we'll see, I suppose. I think maybe they'll find a place to hang, just like the other moths did. Wow, so many moths. Now ladies and gentlemen, I do have some bad news. In one week time, I have booked a trip to the United Kingdom and I am going to London. 
Well, currently it's December when I'm recording this and I'm going to be in the United Kingdom for seven days around Christmas time. And um, I, I'm going to do a lot of fun things. I'm going to meet up with some of my fans and viewers, but also just seeing some old friends. Believe it or not, not all the friends that I have in real life are followers. Although many of them are people I met online. Some of them are fans, some of them are not fans. Some of them don't even care about mods. I, I have a lot of friends in the United Kingdom. Obviously I'm not going to say their names, it would be an invasion of their privacy. So why is that bad news? That sounds awesome, right? You're going to see the Christmas lights, you're going to see, go, and go to London. Well, it's bad news because my moths are emerging right now. And this has basically been, um, well, so far it's been a two and a half month filming and rearing project. These videos take a lot of time to develop, I have to write them out, I have to breed the insects, film their development every few days. And this is the climax. The moment the moths are coming out is the climax. And the problem is while I'm traveling in another country, there is the possibility that while I'm in London, all my moths are going to come out. And when I come back home, all of them will have emerged and I will have missed the show. This is why I rarely travel. I only travel in winter, because in winter I have less insects to breed. If I travel in the middle of summer, when it's the prime breeding season, I probably have to leave hundreds of insects behind in the care of my parents which are not good at breeding insects. And I will also miss the life cycle of many insects I've been filming for months, if not years. So that's devastating. And I, I really hope that soon we're going to see a whole time skip of seven days. And if I really have bad luck in seven days, like the majority of my moths will have come out and we will have missed it. We will have missed the moment that all my moths come out. If that happens, I apologize, people. I apologize. Um, but running a YouTube channel is hard. And it depends on luck and sometimes a lot of free time I don't have and commitment. Whew. So we're going to see. Anyway, the good news is we already had four beautiful green males. They're in this. Ooh, that was my smartphone. They're in his cage. And so, whatever happens next, even if we miss all the other cocoons hatching, at least you've seen what the males look like. So we haven't missed everything. Then again, usually moths tend to hatch sporadically from their pupa. And I think that while I'm gone, we're going to miss the enclosure of a lot of individuals. I don't think that when I come back to the Netherlands after one week that all of them have come out. That would be pretty bizarre. Anyway, if there's a whole time skip in this video, now you know why. Thanks for watching. Let's continue. Then let's leave them alone for now. Great news everyone. Today I was checking the cocoon box and we saw two more new moths. Of course, let's check them out, they're beautiful. Here are the two moths, can you see them? Here's moth number one, here's moth number two. So that, that means in total now we have six males. Not bad. <laughs>
it a moth? No, ladies and gentlemen, it's both. I want to introduce you to Trabala Vishnu, the rose myrtle lapid moth. A wonderful species of moth that comes from Asia. And as you can see, its camouflage is green and very leaf-like, which makes it absolutely cute. Very fascinating and beautiful. Wow. Look at these beautiful patterns. If you're curious about this moth species and its life cycle, I guess you have to go to my big main YouTube channel. It's called Bart Coppins. This is just a short outtake of a long life cycle video I'm doing on them. But wow. Incredible, huh? Right, ladies and gentlemen. So our total amount of moths now is six males. The only thing missing right now is females. These are not females, because females have a slightly different color. I guess you'll see when they come out. But I'm not unhappy with this result. Unfortunately, I have to go to London in just a few days' time. I have seven days left before I gotta go to the United Kingdom, fortunately. So maybe we are going to miss the eclosion of many more moths. But hey. I'm still happy I'm here for this moment and this happened before I leave to another country for a short time. They are really delightfully beautiful insects. My heart is beating faster by just looking at them. They are so gorgeous and so beautiful. And I am so glad and privileged to be one of the few people to experience their life cycles up close. I mean, how many people can do that? Well, hey, one of them woke up. Wow, I love them. All right, let's put them back into their cage and wait for females to come out. That's what we will, that's what we would need to complete a life cycle. Bunch of girls for the males. And yet my spider sense is tingling today. And when I say spider sense, of course we mean my moth sense. Oh, something green smiling at us and we know what it is. It is the males of the beautiful species Trabala Vishnu. Oh yes. And here on the floor, on the bottom of all the toxic cocoons, just as toxic as my Discord servers and WhatsApp chat. There you go, look at that. What a fine species. So we have two more males. I'm starting to wonder where are the girls at? Come on, we need just one, one female. Would be good timing. Eight males is what we got ourselves. Eight gorgeous little males, but where are them girls at? Come on girls, you're late. We have a lot of beautiful single bachelors here. We're now trying to fly away. Ah, isn't this piece the best? Actually, this is the first life cycle of a leopard moth on the Moth Cycles web series. But in the future, I'm going to do many more leopard moths. You see, my web series Moth Cycles have has one big issue. I am a huge fan of Saturnidae silk moths and I think I filmed like 25 episodes and like over 20 of them are about Saturnid moths, the giant silk moths, but they get too much attention, you know? This family gets too much attention. Maybe because they're my favorites. But I want more leopard moths on my channel too and this is happening right now. In the future, you can expect to see way more of them. I promise you that, all right? For now, let's just enjoy these incredible animals. Wow, they are beautiful and green. Anyways, let's leave them in their cage and really hope for a female soon. Let's check back a few days later. So many males. Oh my God. Seriously, why do I only have males? Can't we simply have just one female? There are so many males right now. It's starting to look like politics. Let's check back some days later. All right, folks, just saw some activity in the cocoon box. And once again, we have a few new males. 
yeah they are pretty they are green but i think that we'll i think we're already past the stage of amazement since i've already shown you shown you them several times at this point so just about to collect them oh my god it's only males again are you for real only males oh oh it's a beautiful species but really i <laughs> i really need a female man Oh, my luck is so bad. Any butterfly or moth breeder can tell you that the males coming out before the females is rather normal. Not only in butterflies and moths, but in other insect families as well. Males tend to have a shorter development time. But this is a little bit ridiculous, people. This is too much. Really? 11 males and no females? I mean, come on, everyone, is it too much to ask to have one or two females? 12 males and zero females, man, that is just my luck, you know? That is just my luck. I mean, hey, I'm happy the breeding project is so successful, but come on, man. I gotta have some pairings. I need to have some eggs. Yo, hurry up females, wherever you are. Personally, I'm, I'm starting to think that a dating app for moths wouldn't be that much of a bad idea anymore. Even more annoyingly, these males only live for a few days, so in like one week I'm gonna be all out of males. Then watch the females come out, wanna bet? Always happens. One day later, all right, folks, I just opened the container because I noticed some movement. You know, I'm happy and all that our breeding project has succeeded, but this is getting a little bit stupid, man. Two more males. Just what I needed. Not. Yay, there's a lot of males. I'm not going to lie, I'm starting to get a little bit annoyed. Because uh, all of these are going to die single most likely. This is an annoying species really. The males are too fast. And I haven't had a single female yet. <sighs> I mean I'm not that angry because they are beautiful. And I'm happy to look at them, but I'm also annoyed that it's like we have like 14 males and not a single female. That's, that's just annoying. That's just a waste, you know. I opened one cocoon to look at the development of the pupa. This looks like one big female pupa. And from what I can see, she is not totally developed yet. Like the eyes seem to be developed, but not the wings and the body, so it's gonna be bad news. I think the females are going to come out when all the males have died. Hmm. Man, I just saw a moth coming out. It's currently inflating the wings. And guess what it is? Of course it's a male! I'm starting to get annoyed with all these males now, to be honest. Come on, man! It's one female too much to ask.
Let's check back several days later. <sighs> this is looking bad. Why did I raise so many males? Males, 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 male, male. I'm going crazy. There is a thing such as too many males, you know. In fact, we have so many males. At this point, they can form the American Congress. We have so many males right now that they think the Joe Rogan podcast is a valid source of information. In fact, there are so many males that instead of going to therapy, they're calling each other's kings and chads. In fact, there are so many males. They're starting to think the reason they're unable to find a girlfriend is because modern women aren't traditional enough. Despite the fact that they spend half their time on the internet, Reddit and 4chan and social media watching YouTube videos. Um, um, anyway, let's check back a few days later. Yeah, I saw some more activity in the closing books. <laughs> we know the drill by now. We know the drill by now. Wow. It's another meal. Let's see if there's... Ah! <laughs> yes, there she is. Guys, I just found a female. I didn't even see her before. Oh, yes. Let's take a closer look. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So this huge yellow banana colored thing is the female of the Trabala Vishnu. Well, I didn't even notice her when I first opened the container, but there she is. Would you have a look at that? Well, I'm so glad that I still have a female before I go to London and miss half of my malls e-closing. But this is pretty much great. Wow, how, how. The female of this species is bigger than I anticipated, but she is beautiful. Wow. What a beautiful species this is. Alright people, so here now side by side I have the female and the male that just came out together on the same day. And I just want you guys to appreciate the size difference between the male and the female. Now in Lazio Campet Moss this is pretty normal. And there's a lot of species in which you will see huge females and very small males. I mean in almost every type of moth, well not all of them, but almost all of them the males are smaller, but in Lazio Campets this difference is usually even greater. Just look at that, compared to the female. Male is quite tiny, isn't he? Wow! I'm so happy that before I leave my country we can film this. Yeah, beautiful. The females of this species do seem to have a huge swollen abdomen. Like a huge abdomen. I doubt she can even fly if she wanted to. Like wow, look at how huge the abdomen is. So on the bottom of her, her butt she has a lot of hairs. And these are protective hairs that will protect her eggs when she lays them. In fact when she's done laying eggs, she will cover her eggs with those hairs. It's like a protective furry coating. Crazy, huh? So this female right here, she's going to go into a cage with like 15 other males. Oops. Um, one female versus 15 males. Well, if this doesn't result in a pairing tonight, I'm gonna freak out. Before I put her in, just gonna look at her incredibly massive abdomen. If the camera wants to collaborate, yeah, there you go. Look at that huge abdomen. Probably chock full of eggs. So I can continue generation number two. So let's place her in the cage here with the other males. And then we leave them in the darkness tonight and we check back perhaps tomorrow. They do pair in the dark, this species. Bart Coppens entomology vlog. It is middle of the night. It's three o'clock at night. Let's see what's going on with our insects. Oh wait, what is that I see? Oh my god. Hoo ya! Yeah. In case you kids were unaware, this is what a freaking pairing looks like. If the pairing is successful, it looks like the moths will stay together for a long time. 
up to 24 hours like this male and female who have mated and they're still attached after one day so that means she's going to lay fertile eggs, yay! Oof, scales and dust are flying everywhere anyway now the males of this species do not age well Here's some of the older males who are now several days old. And look at what happened to their wings. They are so active and restless, like within a few days they'll absolutely destroy themselves and then die. A lot of people ask me, Bart, why don't you sell specimens of your moths online for my collection? Well, this is why, because most of them end up looking terrible. As for this female, she has laid a lot of eggs. Now the eggs of this species are bizarre, because they are laid in a straight line. Can you see this? This is a line of Trabala eggs. Can you see that? So the way she lays them is really, really interesting and weird. It's a conga line. That is crazy, huh? So weird. Here in the back there's even more of them. Which is also crazy. Anyway, let's leave them alone and check back in a week. Alright ladies and gentlemen. This is the last thing I'm recording before I go to the UK. I put the rest of the cocoons here in a cage. And I can only check back on them seven days later from this moment right now so in seven days time i'm about to check back and probably a lot of them will have emerged and we will have missed their emergence unfortunately wow so this is me in london cool huh or not please enjoy some of the scenery because i wanted to show you anyway i was right there before christmas and there were cool christmas lights had an amazing time there and great experiences.
But what was even more surprising is that I was invited behind the scenes at the entomology facilities at the Cambridge University. I was honored to be able to take a look there. That's right, people, this is where entomologists are doing a lot of groundbreaking research. Of course, exactly what I am interested in. Sadly, personally, I don't have a degree, but I would love to be involved more in research. The good news is that since recently, I've gotten the news that I'm actually going to research moths on a scientific level in the rainforest soon. However, when I say science, the kind of things that I publish are uh, not at Cambridge University level. I am a lower level entomologist after all that mainly does research on simple things such as like faunistics. Although that kind of stuff is important too, despite being less complex, it's still science. It was inspiring to see however, and it does inspire me to study even harder in the future. Yeah, not that often. I think they're a bit newer than the Platymeres, but not super new. They've been around for a few years. Mm -hmm. So that's a male. Um, what are they doing? Uh, it was like hungry, something is moving. Is that a food? And I, oh no, it's, it's a friend. <laughs> they get about twice. This is the first end line I've ever seen. By ah, me. nice. So they actually, this species cannot walk forward, they can only slide backwards. It's <laughs> <laughs> cute. You look right. It is weird. It's like a reverse crab. Can we see them annoyed with the cube? There's now introduced uh, commercial fishes who are introduced to the lake. Yeah, we have the Nile perch. That and they're like decimating yeah, the, so the cichlid. Basically, you've got like a Nile perch, and in the gut you've got a smaller Nile perch, and then you've got a small Nile perch, and then you've got, then you've got a cichlid. Yeah. And then we have one freshwater lamprey. Yeah. Well, several, actually, two species we have. Yeah, we found one. to show you more but this video is about moths and it's not about my travel experiences and to be honest I didn't even film that much this time I just wanted to enjoy the experience in real life not everything has to be about YouTube or social media all the time then I flew back several nights at a friend's place several nights in my hotel and one wild drunk night at someone else's hotel, later, I took a flight back to my own country.
Hello everyone, this is your favorite online entomologist Bert Coppens. Let's continue the Trabala project. Forgive my hairstyle, I just got out of the shower, I traveled for seven days, I was dirty. But I just came home and we have two cages. One is the cage with the older moths and one is the cage with the cocoons. We're going to inspect them and see how they have been doing uh, while I was not here for a week. Let's, let's check it out. Now, as I kind of expected, almost none of the moths I had before I left are still alive. That's an understatement. As you can see, they are absolutely destroyed. Like, this is what is left of the dead moths. Um, not much. And if we take some of the older males here, as you can see, all of them are pretty much dead. Wow, that's a very good timing on the church bell there, when I said they were dead. Pretty much all our old moths have perished. But, that's, that's, that's what was expected really, that's not really uh, bad news, it's normal. Yep, dead males, they don't really last for longer than a week, in captivity very much. We do have the eggs here in the back, I will collect those later, because I'm sure those eggs are fertile. That's not really the interesting part, however. The interesting part is cage number two, where I placed all the cocoons. And yeah, as you can see, we do have some cool updates. When I said that while I was gone, probably most of the females are going to eclose, I was actually right. You have to be real careful, because now we actually have the females out. So, wow. First thing I see, people, look at this. First thing I see is a pairing. So while I was gone, males and females have eclosed and even started mating. Can you see it? Here's a male and a female that are mating. So that means already there's going to be way more fertile eggs. That's actually excellent news. Let's proceed. Ta-da! People, exactly as I have predicted before I left, while I was gone, the females started coming out. The good news is not all of them. There's like one, two, there's five females out right now. Uh, some of them have kind of awkward wings, but most of them look pretty good. This one is even mating, the big female here. So, that means we didn't, me, didn't really miss that much. And these females are probably going to leave like a ton of fertile eggs. Which is once again good news for all of us. That is fantastic. So I'm actually glad. Some of these females really do look very big, impressive and healthy. Which is fantastic news. Compared to the small males that we all had. It is annoying that the males come out first and then die, and then you have a lot of single females. But as you can see, we still had some males that mated with these. So they're going to lay fertile eggs, absolutely. For me, that's great news, really. That's all we wanted. Look at how big the female is, though. It's a crazy difference in color and size and shape. What a beautiful insect, if you ask me. So crazy how they look like autumn leaves, wow. It's really beautiful. Alright guys, that is not so bad. Let's see what happens next, I suppose.
man, I wish I had such awesome camouflage so I can hide myself from people who don't believe in evolution. Hey, I don't want to get political, but I think those kind of people have the IQ of a potato. That's racist! You're Why? a racist! I said a potato. Potatoes have feelings too! Potatoes aren't that smart, okay? Potatoes are fucking stupid. What the f what kind of therapist are you? You're not even a real licensed therapist. You're just a potato. Good news everyone. I'm mentally healthy. I'm mentally healthy. That's what this potato says. <laughs> Then let's leave them alone for now. <laughs> All right, folks. Seems like every day I have a few new moths now. It's part of the job. So you're a nice female that just came out. Let me adjust the camera. So we can have the optimal lighting and color. Ah, yes. Just fantastic, isn't it? Do I have one of the coolest jobs in the world? The answer is yes, I do. Awesome. Awesome. They look so much like a leaf, it's very convincing. Like the way their hind wings stick out like that. I think it's brilliant. It really is. Just some variation here between two females. The tone and shade of the yellow kind of varies, I suppose. This one kind of looks greenish, even. Well, that's great. So let's check back a few days later again, folks. Why? To wrap things up and see how the Tabala are doing. All right, folks, we've had a lot of fun, but all good things must come to an end. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to collect the eggs of the moths that we have raised in captivity. I'm going to actually sell part of the eggs, believe it or not. Sometimes I do sell them, usually not in public, but behind the scenes. With people who support my channel on Patreon. Yep, that seems fair to me. My channel is demonetized and it basically runs on donations for like 100%. So the people who support me like that, I usually send them the eggs. If they live in a country where it's legal, of course. Now I've shown this before, but this species later egg, lays their eggs like this in rows. So you can see. They're hairy. They're covered with tufts of hair from their abdomens, which protects them. If we zoom out, we see that there's actually a lot of egg clusters here on the inside of this cage, like a whole lot. So, what I'm going to do is, well, collect them. See if we can uh, sell some of them. I also keep some for myself to raise another generation, but most of them I'm going to sell them away. Uh, very soon I'm going to research butterflies and moths in the rainforest in Brazil. I will be doing reforestation there, replanting trees in the rainforest, helping with the conservation of butterflies and moths, so that's great, isn't it? 
Therefore, I cannot afford to have too many pets, because when I leave, other people will have to take care of them for me when I'm not present. So, I'm gonna sell most of the eggs instead of keeping them myself. There you go. Yeah, these eggs are some of the hairiest ever. But as you can see, we collected a whole lot of them. Hundreds of eggs that I'm going to send away. These are I'm going to sell to other breeders. And here are some of the eggs I want to keep for myself just to incubate them and have another generation of tiny little Trabala babies. Most excellent, I say. So we almost have the conclusion of our breeding project. Let me briefly, sh briefly show you this female. Because she's kind of greenish. Not as green as a male. But less yellow and more green than the other females. Anyway, that's it. Alright fools, we are nearing the end. Let's wait for about two and a half weeks and see how those, how those eggs of ours are doing. They generally hatch in about three weeks. What's up ladies and gentlemen? Do you like my awesome sweater? This is my Christmas sweater. Why am I wearing it? Well, because the moment that I'm filming this, it's Christmas in the Netherlands right now. Of course, while well, I've uploaded this video, it's not going to be Christmas anymore. So, I'm extra colorful today. Anyway, I was just checking here the container. The petri dish of the eggs, and guess what I noticed? We have babies! That's right, I'm a daddy now. Um, and I suppose that with that, I, we completed the whole life cycle. That means we're ending, we are nearing the end of the breeding part of this video, so to say. Wow, I'm quite happy. This is a species I wanted to uh, film the YouTube life cycle of for a long time. It's one of my favorite leopard moths, you know, and the fact how they look like camouflage leaves. It just really quite fascinates me. Honestly, I think it's a beautiful species. Like the caterpillars with their tufts of hair and stuff, they're really crazy. Let me show you what we have. Moths are such breedable and submissive creatures. Let's see what we have. See how these eggs are really hairy. Super hairy, but if we adjust the camera. Oh, and of course, it doesn't want to make a close up like usual. Curse you, camera. Ah, yes, can you see that? Come on, make the close up, man. You annoying little wench. There you go. Did I just call my camera a wench? Did I just literally use a weird gendered insult to insult my camera? So strange. Anyway, these are our babies. I don't know if you can see them, but these little things here are caterpillars. And it's it's pretty much come full circle, hasn't it? Like we pretty much ended the video exactly where we've started it. So like wow, we went from a few eggs and caterpillars to a lot of eggs and caterpillars, so we managed to produce more in the end, more than we started with. And that's the point of breeding insects, isn't it? To produce more of them than you started with. I'd say we've done a pretty good job. Awesome. I really love this species, like, this is so much one of my favorite species of leopard moth. By the way, the leopard moth, the Lassio Campidae, they deserve so much more attention in my opinion. Like, they don't get any attention at all, especially if you compare them like to silk moths and hawk moths and stuff. Anyway, here is a plastic container that's going to be their new home. So I raised the first generation on sweet gum, but it's winter right now, it's actually literally Christmas. So here we have cherry, Brunus laurocerasus, laurel cherry and some firethorn, piracanta. And the caterpillar scan feed on that. So, just gonna use a paintbrush, like usual, to scoop up the caterpillars and place them in their new little container here. See how they like it, really. Well, actually, you know what? 
I'm just going to place this whole petri dish in. I'm kind of too lazy to separate all the caterpillars from their eggs. I'm sure that they will find their way eventually. That is insane. Wow. Have fun eating. So how's the rest of our Trabala doing? Well, people, I think we reproduced them. So at this point, um, I kind of want to go through the rest of the video fast. Because in Moth Cycles is a web series in which we raise them from caterpillars to moths and then see if we can produce more caterpillars. And we kind of succeeded, so the life cycle is kind of over right now. Anyway, um, as for the rest, most of the moths have eclosed and paired, but I have six cocoons left. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five. Six, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there are still six cocoons left, and all of them are female cocoons. There you go. I guess this was number seven, but this one just now eclosed, so I'm not going to add it to my count. So here's a last opportunity for you to look at this marvelous insect. So how do I know that the rest of my cocoons, all of them are going to be females? Is it possible to sex cocoons? Well, usually it isn't, but with Trabala it's actually quite easy. And the answer is the size, because the cocoons of a female are double the size of those of males because males are really small compared to the females as you may have seen in this video so just by looking in this container i can see all of this is going to be females so breeding wise this is going to be quite worthless like all of these are gonna be oops all of these are gonna be females so like there's not gonna be any new fertile eggs from all of this you know so I wanna, let's show you the rest of the females that they close quickly, I guess. Here's one of them, but I don't really wanna keep showing you all of them. I feel that like it would prolong this YouTube episode for a too long time. So, and there's not going to be any more breeding with only females. So that's pretty much it. I'm gonna wrap it up faster now. Let's speed up the pace. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, with the life cycle finished, huh? What's this doing here? Now, with the life cycle finished and us having baby little caterpillars, it's time to start the next sequence. You see, you're watching my online web series, Moth Cycles. It's one of the most um, popular web series I invented myself on YouTube. And in each episode of Moth Cycles, we have like a, a vlog-like format in which I raise caterpillars from tiny eggs to adult moths. And we film the whole life cycle, vlogging style. And in the, this web series usually ends when, uh, when all the moths have died or have made offspring, babies. So the life cycle is now complete and I showed you all the life stages. But then we always have a part two, it's called a discussion, and then we usually have a complete rundown of the species that we raise together. So, because the point of breeding insects is to learn about them, otherwise it's useless, right? We want to learn the biology. Let's go. Trabala Vishnu, the rose myrtle lapid moth, a highly interesting species of moth. So today we have a lot to talk about and it feels good to show their life cycle on YouTube for curious minds. This species of lapid moth is very charismatic with leaf green males and bright yellow females. They are beautiful and easy to raise if you can get them to feed. 
The species is also regarded as exceptionally common in a lot of places. Although the spy tent and moth breeding hobby, they can be a little bit hard to get and they are generally offered once every few years. And definitely not every season. Today we are going to talk about their biology and um, what makes these miracles of nature tick. I hope you enjoyed this life cycle. I worked hard on documenting them. Sorry if parts of it were a little bit silly and humorous. That's because YouTube is entertainment and I have to increase the entertainment value somehow. Not everybody likes dry videos about moths. They are from a moth from the Lacio Campidae family known as the Lapid moths. Interestingly, I have personally raised many species of Lacio Campidae in captivity, but I've never done a moth cycles episode on them before. So this makes them the first official Lapid moth episode of moth cycles. This family of moths is interesting and diverse and a little bit understudied. And today I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about this awesome species. First and foremost, the distribution. This species in particular is from subtropical to tropical parts of Asia. Within this area, it's found in tall shrubland, mangroves and abandoned agricultural land and grassland, usually in lowlands or lower levels of elevation. It prefers hotter climates, but interestingly, the species does occur in a number of places with hot summers yet cooler winters, such as parts of Taiwan and Japan. A fun fact about this species is therefore that they are able to hibernate at cooler temperatures in the egg stage. In the egg stage they remain dormant when it's cold, only to hatch in spring as temperatures rise in their subtropical environments. Some of the countries it's found in are Taiwan, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Japan, China, India and possibly also Myanmar. Trabala Vishnu can survive in many places, even including developed areas provided there is enough vegetation. These include agricultural lands, but also parks, urban shrubland, grasslands and more. This makes it one of the more commonly encountered leopard moth species in some of these regions, especially because the larvae are polyphagous and can survive by feeding on a number of crops that humans farm for food production, such as tea plant, coffee plant, guava, castor bean, java plum, and a bunch of other fruit trees, like certain kinds of citrus and therefore they can persist to some degree in environments that are altered by humans and the moths and their caterpillars are commonly encountered in some rural parts of Asia. Interestingly, it seems that in every geographical location, caterpillars do seem to have a preference for different plants. As somebody who raised this species several times, it's notable they show sometimes different food plant preferences and reject plants they would otherwise accept. One of the strengths of this species is that they can be considered in a lot of ways to be a generalist. Encountered in a variety of habitats, they are found in mangroves, forests, agricultural lands and to some extent pastures, abandoned development, uh, developed terrains, tall shrublands, hills and mountainsides. So their caterpillars can eat tons of plants. Certainly not every plant but a large enough variety of plants for them to find something suitable in a diversity of landscapes. Reported are Terminalia miriocarpa, East Indian almond, Ricinus communis or castor bean, Shoria robusta or sal tree, Malotus philippensis or camala tree, Quercus or oak tree, Camellia sinensis or tea plant, Eucalyptus, Lagerstrumia or crab myrtle, Rhodomyrtus tormentosa or rose myrtle, Psidium guava or guava, Coffea arabica or coffee plant, but this isn't even all yet. They also take Eugenia, Berberis asiatica or Asian barberry, Java plum or Cisigium cumini, Verbascum tap sus, sus, sussy sussy, Verbascum baca. Sorry, I will behave. Verbascum tap sus or great mullein, liquid amber or sweet gum. Hippophae rhamnoides or sea buckthorn, Albizia, certain types of rosa or rose, Sweetania, maho mahago Sweetania mahagonia or mahogany, and Punica granatum or pomegranate, and actually many more plants. So the list that you see right here is not complete and maybe impossible to complete because they can literally feed on hundreds of plants. But these are some of the most important ones they use in the wild. Please be careful when importing the eggs of this insect over international borders. 
It is classified as a pest in some places. This is probably due to their appetite for food crops like coffee, tea, pomegranate, guava and other fruit trees that farmers like to produce for income. The good news is that I don't find it unethical to breed these in captivity where I live. I, Bart Coppens, live in the Netherlands, an extremely temperate country in northern Europe with long cold winters and mild summers. There is about zero chance that they could survive here or establish here. But do be careful in subtropical or warm climates. It's a bad idea to ship them to other countries in Asia or subtropical places like Florida or maybe even some parts in southern Europe. When it comes to a pest species, don't fuck around, follow the law and please be ethical. That being said, do they really deserve their reputation? Of course, and some people will cringe when I say this, but maybe it's the farmers that are the true pest on our planet. We have to feed a world population of billions of mostly unnecessary humans, unfortunately, and more of them are being born every day. Therefore, we have to destroy the environment to grow food. But perhaps this is a simplistic and semantic opinion. I'm sorry if it offends. But honestly, sometimes it's tiresome that we terraform entire forest and natural environments into agricultural monocultures, spray them with toxins and then label any kind of animal that somehow managed to survive or take advantage of this sort of landscape a pest. But okay, I digress. Agriculture is in many ways a cancer by itself that's ruining our planet, although I suppose a necessary evil too for our species, so I'll stop being political and grumpy and give you some facts instead. The bad news is that yes, there is evidence that Trabala Vishnu is a species that can inflict economical damage to agricultural practices. One such publication titled Severe Incidence of Hairy Caterpillar Trabala Vishnu on Pomegranate Punica Granatum and then reports Severe defoliation by a hairy caterpillar Trabala Vishnu during monsoon period in an unsprayed experimental orchard of the Indian Institute of Horti Horticultural Research, Bangalore, Karnataka, India. Caterpillars of mixed instars were found feeding um, on the tender foliage causing severe defoliation. Preliminary observations revealed that the infestation was observed to be severe, with 55.80% um, of plants in the experimental orchards being infested, which is 48 out of 86 plants, with an average defoliation of 37.5% per tree. Now that's actually a lot of damage. Up to 15 larvae were observed feeding voraciously on plants. There is more evidence too. Spectroscopic studies in the host plant selection mechanism of Trabala Vishnu Gigantina has something to say for us as well. Trabala Vishnu Gigantina is a polyphagous forestry pest whose periodic breaking out results in great economic damage, including total crop failure to forestry and fruit production in China. Okay, that is pretty severe. The moth Trabala Vishnu Gigantina is a leaf-eating pest, and there have been severe outbreaks in it um, in Hippophae rhamnoides, which is sea buckthorn plant, plantations in North China. Now, if one dives into the literature, there can be more reports like these, such as Trabala Vishnu being a pest on tea plant or Camellia sinensis, or in this case, sea buckthorn or Hippophae rhamnoides, pomegranate, like the one I mentioned before, and even plants like cedrus. The average is clear. To some degree, yes, the insect can be a defoliator and yes, a pest. So yes, the insect is in fact a pest. Although the actual economic damage they can do does seem to be unquantified in many cases, although damage is reported. And despite evidence they have damaged crops, sometimes resulting to the point apparently um, of crop failure, and a multitude of publications describing them as defoliators of tea plants, buckthorn and other economic crops, there doesn't seem to be a huge abundance of information either, nor major quantifications showing, showing the scope and the extent of the combined damage worldwide, which is something I would like to see. Therefore I'll say that while it is a pest, most of the time it is a minor pest. Why minor? Because first of all, the instances of the insect acting as a pest exist, but also seem to be based on limited reports for such a widespread insect. Second of all, the insect is a generalist and can feed on many other plants than just food crops. 
Therefore, it implies they aren't dependent on propagating themselves on food crops exclusively, which means the species doesn't target particular crops, it just happens to be able to feed on them if they are present. Although this is what may happen if humans create monocultures of some of their host plants. Which, to be honest, is also the very definition of a pest, and I guess their ability to feed on plants that are not commercially important doesn't make the damage less significant when they do decide to feed on economically important plants. However, it does imply the species is more of a generalist than a specialist, and this means the species is not a pest in each instance where it occurs. For example, the insect is quite common in shrublands, hillsides and mangrove forests where they don't harm the economy, nor do they harm the environment or people. It's perhaps their presence in areas where they are harmless, at first, that can make them economically harmful later if this environment is transformed into a monoculture consisting of plants that they like. The caterpillars of this species are quite cute, colorful and charismatic, bright yellow but sometimes also white, hairy and with a red face and silly tufts of hair. Adorable! The bad news is, however, their fur coat is not that innocent. The caterpillars of this species do have defensive hairs and if handled or touched, this may cause mild to severe skin irritations or rashes. Interestingly, your reaction to the caterpillars will vary per person. Personally, I really didn't sense much irritations from them at all, despite handling them several times. But maybe I am more immune from handling hundreds of caterpillars. Some people, however, do report itchiness and irritations on their body after handling the larva. Therefore, it is not a family-friendly species per se. People with allergies, asthma or people who are immunocompromised may suffer more intensely when coming into contact with the species. Be careful with touching or raising them in households with vulnerable people. That being said, the itchiness doesn't uh, seem to last very long and tends to disappear within 10 minutes without any long-term effects. And they aren't very dangerous or venomous, just mildly annoying. More noxious than the caterpillars are actually the cocoons. Personally, the cocoons really made me itchy, but the caterpillars didn't. I recommend handling the cocoons with gloves. The flight time of this moth varies a lot in each country where it occurs, but generally speaking, the eggs hibernate throughout the cold season and hatch in the warmer season, upon which the moths can produce several generations. Commonly, they have two to three generations per year in subtropical locations. The moths do not feed. The climate permits them to have fewer or more generations. The shorter and milder the winter, the longer their breeding season and the more generations they may produce locally. The females of this species have hairy tufts on their abdomens. When they begin laying eggs, they systematically cover them with these hairs. This makes the eggs very hairy. The hairs on the eggs provide protection from predators, but also perhaps lower temperatures. The species is able to hibernate through the winter and this is necessary in some locations like Taiwan, Japan and other subtropical places in which the environment winters can be colder. Hibernation seems to take place in the egg stage. Interestingly, there does seem to be a number of distinct subspecies. Here, for example, is the endemic subspecies from Taiwan, Trabala Vishnu Ghetata. The biggest difference is in this subspecies that the caterpillars, their fur seems to be rather white and blonde, instead of the more typical brighter yellow that we see. Think of them as the more bleached hair variety. There are other subspecies too with differences, such as Vishnu Gigantina, Vishnu Singala and Vishnu Vishnu. However, the exact differences and exact distribution of all these subspecies seem to be quite vague to me at the moment. And perhaps it needs to be a little bit more research to, dis to define their distribution well. If you have more information about this and you are experienced, please let me know in the comments or send me an email about the respective subspecies of Trabala Vishnu so I can understand them better. It's quite hard for me to find more information about their subspecies. One of the problems with Trabala though is that there are many species of them. This can make them hard to identify. Of course, the females in this picture look different visually, but in reality not all species are that distinct. In fact, a number of them look almost identical to Trabala Vishnu with minor differences. I remember moth trapping in Asia when I was studying moths in Cambodia and Laos, and identifying the several species of Trabala that came to my moth trap, and uh, it was actually one of the more difficult things that I've done. The females of most species can differ in size or color or spots, 
although males of most species are green and can in some cases look almost identical. I think this genus is truly one that needs some more research or a revision, or at least some sources that make them more easy to identify because it's really hard to find them online. So um, more tools who can help us identify all the species and subspecies uh, of Trabala, that would uh, be great. In fact, there is a probability there are still many undescribed species of Trabala out there that haven't been given a name. Not to mention there are a lot of leopard moths who can look like them too, but are different. Interestingly, a lot of species of Trabala are named after Buddhist or Hinduist figures. Such as, for example, Trabala Krishna, Trabala Ganesha, Trabala Brahma, Trabala Shiva, Trabala Garuda, Trabala Indra, Trabala Aryuna, Trabala Gautama, and many of these figures are gods. This species, for example, was found in China. Can you identify it? What Trabala species is this from China? Go on, there's a challenge for you. Try and identify this Trabala species, right? From China. Okay, try it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Did you find out what Trabala species it is? Hmm? Congratulations. It was Crinocraspeda torida, a leopard moth from Asia. If you guessed any species of Trabala, you didn't even correctly guess the genus. And now you understand how confusing these moths can be to identify sometimes, let alone within the same genus. Trabala species in general are found in tropical to subtropical Asia, but also in tropical Africa. Many of their life cycles are in fact very poorly studied, although the most common species perhaps which Trabala Vishnu is one of the better known ones. Perhaps maybe in the future we can examine more species on my channel, but that would be very interesting. However, I can't do it without your help. These filming, breeding and researching projects take months to film, write and edit. It truly is hard work. Let me tell you more about this in the next segment. You can insult a man, but if you tell him the truth, you will end up like this potato here. You see, Bart Coppens doesn't like the truth. He wants to be blissfully ignorant while people feed his ego on social media. That was a tasty potato, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. But I'm not here to um, fool around with potatoes. I'll leave that up to uh, the professional cooks, you know. Boiling a potato, if you aren't a chef, are you really doing it right? Anyway, I want to show you how the moths are doing. And this is how they are doing. Ta -da -da -da. Now some of you guys may say, well Bart, uh, they look pretty dead to me. You're right. The moths are dead right now. See, the uh, Trabala Vishnu are not exactly pets that live very long. Moths in general don't really make great pets. You have to be really crazy about moths to want to keep them in the first place. You do a lot of work to raise something that uh, lives for like 5 to 10 days and it's gone. But as you could see in this video, we had babies, we had the next generation. And with that, I think the breeding project was successful once again. Wow. So we have over, uh, uh, we are approaching 30 episodes of moth cycles. 30 species of moth on my YouTube channel you can watch from egg to fully grown moth. And wow, I wonder if we can reach 100 episodes in this lifetime. It's incredible. Anyway, rest in peace moths. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. This was my first episode about a species of leopard moth. Last but not least, sorry about it, if you found some of the jokes in this video cringy, okay? 
Things I said do not necessarily reflect my opinions and I do not condone violence against potatoes, okay? Potatoes are equal. Potatoes have feelings just like me and you. This was just a skit. It was a parody. It was comedy. Um, don't boil potatoes. Don't hurt them. Just like me and you. They have emotions. They are certainly not inferior to us. But for real. There is one thing I wanna, I wanna tell you guys. And this is a little bit more serious. Because something actually very good happened. And I must give some credit for what's about to happen. Let me tell you right now. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, hey. What's up? I hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, this is an episode that, once again, I've been working on for several months. And this piece was really uh, one of the first uh, lappet moths that I ever raised, back in the days. And they're still one of my favorites today, even if now I've raised many more species of lappet moth. But I realized my channel didn't have any life cycle video with a lappet moth. And it feels unfair, because we did a lot of uh, Emperor Moths, uh, Saturnidae family. And I'm like, yeah, I want more diversity on my channel, you know. Uh, silk Moths uh, or Emperor Moths are some of my favorite, but it doesn't mean we should ignore the rest. So my goal for next year is to make more life cycles of other families, like uh, Lapid Moths, uh, Owlet Moths, um, like Noctuidae, Brahmaidae. Uh, last year, Company Day, families like that. I also want to tell you guys about something that happened that is um, actually really important and significant for my channel. I need to tell you about somebody who is named, and his uh, exact name will be protected, but let's say his name is Timothy H. Timothy H. Timothy is a subscriber of mine, and recently. I got a notification that Timothy donated $702 to my channel. $702 donation. Now, I'm going to tell you people, my channel is um, completely demonetized by YouTube. Like, if I make videos like this, I don't earn anything from it. Like, literally nothing. Years ago, uh, YouTube sent me an email that they think my content is somehow uh, not eligible for monetization and I'm permanently demonetized. Now, I sent them several emails asking them to explain their reasoning, like why? What did I do wrong? And in their reply, they said they didn't want to uh, tell me the rule or guideline that I violated. So as of today, I really still don't have a clue about what happened that demonetized my channel. It's absolutely nonsense. And it's really frustrating because I'm a successful YouTuber and I have an audience. There's a, I, I think I get between 50,000 to 100,000 views every month. Um, yeah, there's that many people who are clicking my butterfly and moth uh, videos, up to 100,000 uh, people per month. And it's just absolutely unfair, in my opinion, that um, when other people put in the hard work to make videos, they get paid for it by ad revenue. They get paid for it uh, through YouTube. But I don't, because I violated some kind of guideline. But uh, Timothy, this is uh, really an incredibly, incredibly generous contribution. Uh, I don't even know where to begin thanking you. This is enough to probably help me make five or six new episodes of this web series, Moth Cycles. So this is the budget I'm going to use to make more videos from this series right now. They are very long and time-consuming videos, as you can see. Um, raising insects is a lot of hard work. You also have to film their development every few days because they grow fast, and otherwise you'll miss it. And at the same time, um, it's also a process that can last months. So uh, that's pretty crazy. And 
it's people like you who keep my channel alive, really. Um, people like you, Timothy. So, for today, we are going to light the sparkles again. If you've seen more episodes of Moth Cycles, you've seen the sparkles before. Um, the sparkles are basically a festive uh, celebration that I do when, when there's really good news for my channel. Usually in the form when uh, I get a really large contribution or donation. So, um, because my channel is just completely demonetized by YouTube, so I'm dependent on uh, people like Timothy sending me uh, tips and donations like this. I don't like begging for it on the internet, but it's the only way my channel can survive. It's the, literally the only way, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, I can either ask for what I want and uh, try to get it or don't. It's my vision. And, um, not reminding people of this is going to hold my channel back, unfortunately. I tell you guys, if I won the lottery, if I won a million dollars, I would never uh, do the crowdfunding thing again. I have to be careful, these sparkings, sparkles, they... Oh. I'm going to use this one to light all the rest. Timothy, if you're watching, this is for you, my man. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's today is sparkle day. When you see the sparkles, it means something good happened on my channel, so, oops. I kind of lighted them the wrong way, but whatever. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all the funds I use raise online in the form of crowdfunding. I use them to make videos, obviously, but they will also be used for research and conservation. For example, when you're watching this, in a few days' time, I will be going to the rainforest in Brazil. And what we're going to do there in the Brazilian rainforest, let me tell you about it. It's pretty awesome. We're going to plant new trees in areas that have been deforested. I'm going to research butterflies and moths and help their conservation. Now, insects are declining nowadays, uh, many species are threatened or going extinct. And if there's no people monitoring them, or researching them, then there's no way to help them. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to research what species there are in the area. I'm going to make a checklist of the local uh, silk moths in the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil. I'm also going to look at their sticks, their host plants, um, maybe what species of butterflies I can observe. And all this data will be shared with uh, the local biologist and conservationalist. It's a um, conservation project called Regua. And it's in fact also my fans who paid for it. And I've always said on this channel, when, when I become more successful on YouTube, um, when I start having at least a decent budget to work with, um, I will use it to make a difference. I will use it for conservation uh, and helping the animals that I care about. I've always said this, but I never had a way to prove it until now. So it's like, I can make promises, I can tell you uh, all the good stuff that I wanna do, but those are just promises, right? It's only when I have the budget to do it that I can actually show you that I was genuine and uh, not trying to just gain for, from this channel myself, but also give back to nature. And the good news is we've finally arrived at that point, because in one week I will be going to the rainforest. I will be working with conservation. I will be working with a team of biologists and entomologists. And I will take my camera documenting rare butterflies and moths in the local area. I will show you my work, all the things that I'm going to do there. This channel is going to make a difference. And it's people like you, Timothy, who generously sent me such contributions, who make it happen, really. It's because of you. If other people are watching this, people, this channel is 100% demonetized. You can join us in many ways, for example, on Patreon. 
You can make a contribution via PayPal, via Ko-Fi, via LiberaPay. There's many other methods you can donate or support me as well. Of course, you don't have to. Not everybody is willing or able to donate. I understand that we are living in difficult economic times. Times are really difficult, especially for younger people right now, economically. So it doesn't make you less of a viewer if you don't, okay? Everybody who watches this channel is welcome to join for free. I believe in free information about nature and insects that's accessible for everyone. That's what made my channel so successful. But it's also very difficult to do stuff like this and not have any income because the time I put in this is just insane. And even Bart needs to pay the bills sometimes, even though it sucks. So I'm trying to draw attention to the crowdfunding. If you like the show, as little as $1 a month helps because it adds up. A lot of the people who donate to my channel, they send me like $1. But because there's a lot of people doing it, it helps, you know, collectively, cumulatively. It really, really helps. And it's the only thing keeping this channel alive, because there's a lot of times in which uh, this channel is not really financially sustainable. Especially in summer, when I'm breeding a lot of moths, it's almost full-time work. And uh, I raise about two to four hundred dollar a month, which I'm very grateful for. But I'm trying to grow my channel because I'm ambitious. I have huge ambitions for me and for this YouTube channel. And for that, I need to grow the crowdfunding as well. Sorry, guys, if you think it's annoying. Um, of course, I am not entitled to anything. The fact that I ask for something doesn't mean it has have to happen, right? Asking for something doesn't mean it has to happen. It's a reminder only for those who are willing and able. But uh, yeah. You can buy a subscription on Patreon, and if you do, you'll also receive stuff like merchandise, uh, posters, mugs, stickers um, that I designed myself using my own pictures and photographs of butterflies and moths. You'll be doing me a huge surface and my channel a huge surface. Uh, if you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You can uh, privately even contact me on Patreon, do requests, talk to me, ask me questions. We even have a monthly FHQ that um, all my sponsors can participate in. So there's a lot of rewards that you can uh, receive, such as me answering your questions live, merchandise. We also do special videos, like uh, if I raise a certain amount on a platform called Ko-Fi, we do a special video where I show you a, a special snack for my country. We have a lot of silly stuff like that going on behind the scenes, but also in the scenes on YouTube. That involves the crowdfunding that makes it fun and engaging. Timothy, thank you very much. $702. Um, I'm going to save it on my account until I'm in Brazil. And when I'm in the rainforest soon in Brazil, um, I can use a few hundred dollars to uh, book a guide. And the guide will help me do an expedition deeper into the rainforest or in the mountains or even to the ocean. I can choose anything I want. I just have to pay the guide. And that will uh, make the content really more special because um, it means I can go far away. I can explore a diversity of habitats, right? If I pay a guide where I'm going, um, we can even go to some swamps, swamp areas, and maybe even moth trap there. Uh, maybe go visit the coastline. Like Brazil is a big and beautiful country with a lot of nature. And uh, I can actually do a lot while I'm there next month. I can... Uh, you know, go above and beyond to uh, explore the coolest mountaintops, the craziest mist forest, you know. But it costs money, unfortunately. The good news is everything there is already paid for. But uh, the more budget I have, the more awesome it's going to be. And because of you, Timothy, it's going to be more awesome. Thank you for your massive and generous contribution. You've really helped somebody who um, is independent on YouTube who is demonetized by YouTube, who is a small content creator and who wants to help the environment. So in my opinion, that's a win-win and I hope you enjoy the show in return. That was it. It was the sparkles to celebrate the fact that this happened. And um, yeah, thank you everybody, all my patrons and see you next episode of Moth Cycles. Unfortunately, this could be the last episode in a long time because I'm going away for almost two months, but hey, 
the show must go on and in the future there's going to be more. Bye bye. Thank you.